Hi, this is Justin Coletti. You may know me from Sonic Scoop, but today I am on the Plugin Alliance channel, and we're going to be answering the question, how do you choose the right compressor for whatever instrument you're working on, whatever genre you're in? It seems like there's a limitless choice of compressors out there. Plugin Alliance alone has more than two dozen compressors in the mega subscription bundle. Why are there so many different types of compressors, and how do you know the right one to pick? The fortunate thing for you is that it's actually kind of simple. Once you realize that there's only four major types of compressor, and everything is kind of a subtle variation on each of those four major themes. We're going to be doing a multi-part series here so we can dive deep into each of these major types of compressors. And as we go along in the series, we'll hear more and more audio examples. But for right now and today, I want to give you a broad overview of these major types of compressors, the pros and cons of each, how they're different, and which kind you'd reach for for different kinds of instruments and different kinds of genres. In addition to these four major types of compressors, there's also a couple of others that are a little bit less common that are worth knowing about, and some specialty types of compressors that we'll look into as well. But I believe that once you get to know each of these major types of compressors and really develop a sense of memory for what each one of them sounds like, where they're best suited, choosing the right compressor every single time is going to get so much easier. But before we dive into all these different types of compressors I have pulled up from Plugin Alliance, I just want to take a quick look at the kinds of stock compressor plugins you find built into most DAWs. Right over here, I have the one that's built into Pro Tools. And this type of compressor, I like to call a fully variable compressor. Let's just go over what it does and why companies like Plugin Alliance are so successful in providing so many alternatives to this type of compressor. First, let's talk about what they do well. It gives us control over all the main types of controls you'd expect on a compressor. There's dedicated control for attack and release. There's a threshold control. There is gain. There's ratio. Those are the basic knobs. And then this extra control called knee. This one even has a sidechain filter built in, so you can filter out some of the extreme lows or highs and keep those from triggering the compressor. And when you have a fully variable digital compressor like this, it's a little bit like mixing your own paints. You do have a significant amount of control. The attack goes anywhere from extremely fast all the way up to an extremely slow 300 milliseconds. And you also have crazy fast release and crazy slow release times available right here inside of this compressor. The ratios will go from anywhere from 1 to 1 all the way to 100 to 1. And you also have incredible variation in this knee setting. And while all of that variety can be a good thing, it can actually be a little trickier to get the right sound with a compressor like this one than a compressor that has its own tonal profile, its own kind of color already built in. Some of the most iconic analog compressors in history, producers and engineers love them because you could just kind of throw them up onto a track and they sound great. And if they don't sound great, you take it off and put on a different one and see if that one sounds great. So it's a totally different way of choosing compressor settings. With some of these analog and boutique compressors, it can be a little bit less like haphazardly mixing your own paints and a little bit more like picking the perfect shade of colored pencil or the perfect shade of crayon out of a box. And if it's not the perfect one, you go ahead and pick a slightly different shade. And that can be a really fun and inspiring and intuitive way to work. But even on the compressors from Plugin Alliance that are much more flexible and have many more controls like this, they'll also have another characteristic not found in many stock compressors like this one. They'll have their own natural color, box tone, tonal characteristics unique to that piece of original hardware. Certain ways of coloring, maybe the frequency response a little bit, but maybe the overall saturation profile of the compressor. And these can really give a little bit of character, a little bit of extra mojo to the compressor that you might not find in a sterile, fully variable digital compressor like the kinds built into most DAWs. Today, we'll start looking at some of the alternatives to this type of compressor offered by Plugin Alliance, why and where you might use each of them, and in future entries into this series, we'll get to hear them in more depth and more detail and do more and more audio tests where we can compare one type of compressor to another to really help you develop that kind of sense memory that's going to help you choose the right one every time. But right now for the overview, let's start with the type of vintage, analog, or boutique compressor that is most like the fully variable digital compressors that you'll find built into most DAWs. 
And that would be one of the last types of analog compressors to be invented, the VCA compressor. One of the most popular types of VCA compressors in history is easily the SSL style bus compressors, here exemplified by the BX Townhouse bus compressor from Brainworks. You'll see that like the fully variable digital compressors built into most DAWs, it also has a threshold control, a ratio control, an attack and release and makeup gain. It even has some sidechain filtering built in and a mix knob as well, which is sometimes missing from stock compressor plugins in DAWs. But there are a couple of distinct differences as well. One of them is just the analog color and box tone that this compressor imparts, even if it's not doing any compressing. So many of your favorite records have gone through real analog SSL bus compressors, and they just have a little bit of their own tone, a little bit of their own mojo, and this can help add character and dimension and even tighten up a mix in ways, even when you're not doing tons of compression. And you can get even more of the kinds of saturation and color and grit and hair out of this compressor with a couple of additional controls, like the headroom control, which allows you to drive the compressor harder and harder, as well as all the modeled analog circuitry inside, or turning up this V-gain control to get a little bit of additional analog hiss and noise out of this unit. So that's one side of what makes a compressor like this interesting, but it's also how carefully curated some of these controls are. Instead of having fully variable ratio, attack, and release, you have curated ratio, attack, and release. With a lot of these old school analog designs, there were some limitations in making them, and it wasn't always practical to put fully variable controls on every single compressor design. And there could be a variety of reasons for this, logistical, economic, and engineering reasons. But also, having stepped controls like these can make a compressor like this a little bit easier to use. For instance, instead of obsessing over exactly the right ratio, you basically have low ratio, 2 to 1, medium ratio, 4 to 1, and high ratio of 10 to 1. For attack, we start with a fairly fast three millisecond range. And if you want it to act a little bit more like a gentle limiter, you can go down to 0.1 or 0.3 milliseconds. And this encourages a mode of operation where you're first thinking about what you want the compressor to do. Do I want it to be fast attack or slow attack? And then picking one setting that's in the right neighborhood and see if it sounds good. And if it doesn't, pick another setting at the other extreme. If that doesn't work, Pick one that's a bit in between. There's just a little bit less guesswork than the fine tuning you can do with some fully variable compressors. Not that there's anything wrong with fully variable controls, and a lot of plug in alliance plugins have them, but this is another way of interacting with a compressor that can steer you towards a different workflow and potentially lead you to a little bit less fiddling and second guessing. Similar thing goes on with the release control. There is an auto release function built into this, which has been heard on a countless number of records, and it just instantly sounds familiar. But if that auto release setting is too smooth for you, you can go all the way over to this 0.3 millisecond release time and get some really fast release, edgier compression out of this unit. But this isn't the only VCA compressor out there. In addition to the Brainworks Townhouse compressor, Another extremely popular one, the same theme, would be this Lindell SBC. It's an exacting emulation of some of the most popular American-made compressors in modern music production history. Or there's this Vertigo VSC2 compressor, another VCA-style compressor, which has a tone all of its own. Another super popular VCA compressor would be those modeled by the Amec Mastering Compressor. This one has an extremely transparent sound and also offers a completely different way of interfacing with a compressor. It's almost like having three compressors in one, with dedicated controls for a slow, fast, and peak detector circuit that you can blend to taste. I'm not going to go into an extreme detail about how the sound of each of these major VCA compressors varies from one another. We're going to save that for a future video where we dive deep into VCA compressors and get to hear them back to back. But the core idea is each of them has its own unique tone and its own unique feature set and way of interacting with a compressor that can kind of lead you to different places. In addition to the box tone and character of each compressor that's built right in, each one just offers a different way of interfacing with your compression, a different way of determining exactly how much and what style of compression you're going to apply. So an incredibly useful style of compressor.
But these are the most modern types of analog and boutique compressors out there. There are also more old school varieties that have even more of a specific tonal color and a little bit more of their own unique idiosyncrasies that can be exactly the right thing for a given instrument or style. Before we move on from them, VCA compressors, because they're so flexible, can be used on a whole wide range of sources. They're great for compressing things like percussion and drums. They can also be great for compressing things like vocals, bass, acoustic guitar, and they're often a favorite type of compressor to throw onto the mix bus or to use in mastering applications. But let's now turn our attention to a much simpler and much more old school type of compressor, the opto compressor. Where VCA compressors use a solid state circuit called a voltage control amplifier to enact gain reduction, opto compressors use something very different. These are among the earlier types of compressors ever invented, and they're called opto compressors because inside the actual physical compressor, there'd be basically a little miniature light bulb and a photosensitive cell that would sense how much light was coming from that light bulb. Basically, the hotter the signal got, the more that light bulb would light up. And because of the characteristics of the photocell, you'd get this kind of program-dependent type of compression. And because this type of compressor was designed so early on, many of the most popular and iconic iterations of opto compressors are usually tube compressors that have their own additional bit of grit and saturation and color that comes from an old-school tube device. This particular one I have pulled up here, the Acme Opticom model XLA3, is inspired by designs like the old LA2A style compressor. These compressors usually don't have much in the way of controls on them. The Opticom actually adds a few more controls that aren't available on the original LA2A style compressors. But the beauty of this type of compressor is that you kind of throw it up there and it either sounds great for the source or it doesn't. Its ratio, its attack, its release, all this is dependent on how hot the signal is going into the compressor and the unique dynamic profile of that particular instrument. It's what we call a program-dependent compressor. The style and amount of compression depends on the program material you're feeding into it. The Opticom, however, does add on a fast, normal, and slow mode of operation where a lot of the earliest opto compressors had no adjustment for attack and release speed at all. A great thing about the Acme Audio Opticom is it has such a cool and distinctive box tone. It really does have some color just when you run signal through it. And you do have the option to use it just as a tone box and not as a compressor at all. You can have the compressor be in or out or use it in a amp mode. So you can go through all the painstakingly modeled analog circuitry without applying any compression and just get some of that analog color and mojo that you'd expect to have an old school tube opto compressor. But this is not the only opto compressor that Plugin Alliance has to offer. Another one of my favorites is the BX Opto compressor. This one offers a slightly different tone and a slightly different take on optical compression. It's also potentially a little bit easier to use than some other vintage style opto compressors that are out there. Its peak reduction knob, speed knob, built in sidechain filter, and mix control make it one of my favorite opto compressors. It also just has a little bit less of that tube grit saturation edge and hair that you'll find in old school opto compressors and something like the Acme Audio Opticom. So when you want the characteristics of optical compression without all the additional grit and mojo, the BX Opto is a fantastic way to do it. There's also optical compression built into the Shadow Hills Mastering Compressor and into the Lisa Dynamic EQ. We'll talk about those more some other day. And in another video coming up soon, we'll take a deeper dive into all of the different opto compressors that Plugin Alliance has to offer so we can hear them back to back. What would you use an opto compressor on? Well, because they're generally not super fast compressors or super high ratio compressors, they tend to work really well as averaging compressors. Things like vocals or bass are absolutely wonderful with an opto compressor in many cases. 
On the other hand, instruments like drums or other fast percussion elements that need a much faster attack and faster release, optical compression might not be ideal for them. But with some of these more modern plug-in styles of optical compressors, you can set them quite a bit faster than some of the earliest versions of them might have gone, making them a little bit more practical on those types of instruments. But when you're looking to give things a little bit of extra squeeze and character and do some nice averaging compression without totally chopping off the peaks, optical compression can be a great way to go. Now, another type of vintage old school compressor that's still coveted to this day would be the slightly later answer to the opto compressor, the FET compressor. One of my favorite versions of this type of compression of all time has got to be the Purple Audio MC77 compressor. This is based on the original 1176 Revision E, and this type of FET compressor was an answer to the sometimes sluggish character of an opto compressor. These compressors were designed to be able to go super fast when you needed them to. Their attack controls generally go from really fast to crazy fast, with a release time that can also go exceptionally fast when you want it to. They can give you a little bit more radical pumping and breathing, and some of the most iconic extreme compression effects in history have been achieved with 1176 style compressors. But if you're a little bit more gentle with the way you set the attack and release, they can also do lots of compression without being too overly apparent, just giving a little bit of additional character and control. And there's a lot of male vocals in particular you've heard over the years that have used 10 dB or more of this style of compression and made it onto records that people have loved the sound of for generations. So when you want really significant amounts of compression on things like vocals, parallel drum buses, or on bass guitar, something like this purple MC-77 is a great choice. Again, it's not the only FET compressor emulation that Plugin Alliance has to offer. There's also the Lindell 7X500, which has its own unique tone and its own unique way of interfacing with the compression controls. We'll save the act of going to too much detail and hearing these back to back for another video with more audio examples coming up in the future. But for right now, that's the overview on FET compression. And with three down, we've got one more major type of compressor to go. Number four is going to be the Varimu or all tube compressor. There are two great examples here, the SPL iron and the Neol channel strip known as the V76 U73. In addition to a tube preamp section that has a character all of its own, there is this compressor module inside. And these Varimu tube compressors also have a program-dependent ratio, much like opto compressors, and they tend to have a naturally softer knee. One of the most iconic of the tube Varimu compressors in history is probably the Fairchild. It has been a favorite on things like mix bus, vocals, acoustic guitar, bass, and the SPL Iron is a more modern take on the Fairchild that gives us a little bit more control while retaining a lot of that Varimu tube character. The reason it's named the iron is it has a variety of different transformers to choose from, which along with the tubes is another big component in what makes Varimu tube compressors sound the way they do. A lot of people think that the tone is in the transformers, not just the tubes, and that's definitely a great way of thinking about it. And you can get a lot of variation in color by playing around with the different transformer settings in the SPL iron. Thanks to the additional controls from both SPL and Plugin Alliance, it's easy to make this a lot dirtier or a lot cleaner than the original Fairchild style compressors, and you do have more control over attack and release than was normally available in a lot of old school Varimu tube compressors. The Neold has an incredible character and tone all its own, and we'll hear them back to back in a future video where we dive even deeper on Varimu tube compression. And with that, you've got the four major types of analog compressor. You've got your VCA compressors, which tend to be the most flexible, and they might have a bit of a cleaner color than some of the more even old school compressors out there. You've got your opto compressors, which are great averaging compressors, and they'll often have some tube circuitry built into there, giving them a lot of tone and color. 
You have your potentially really fast acting FET compressors that are a little tighter, more aggressive, and more forward sounding. And you've got your tube varimu compressors that often have somewhat faster attack times, fixed ratio, but with their soft knee and tube circuitry, they can be really forgiving, really beautiful sounding on a whole range of sources. In addition to these four main types, there's arguably two other significant types of analog compressors ever made. There is the diode bridge compressor, and that's available too in the Plug-in Alliance Mega Subscription Bundle in the form of the Lindell 254E compressor. It emulates the thick, smooth, chunky kind of compression popularized by some of the Neve compressors from long ago. You can consider it a cousin of the VCA-style compressors, often giving you some of that kind of flexibility, but with a tone all its own. A final type of analog compressor that's barely been modeled by any software companies are the PWM-style compressors, pulse width modulation, but there aren't so many emulations of those out there from any brand, in part because there was never many of them on the market back in the analog days, and in part because some people believe that they don't offer that many advantages over modern digital compressors, because they were really known for being quite clean sounding compared to other compressors available at that time. That's something that digital can often do well. But speaking of digital, there's a whole bunch of miscellaneous types of compressors that usually take one or more of the themes here and then allow you to do new or different things with them. For example, limiters like the BX Limiter True Peak or the original BX Limiter are basically compressors that are just really, really, really fast with really, really high ratios. The BX Limiter True Peak adds on some additional controls, loudness metering, and true peak compression, which will catch intersample peaks, something we could look at in a future video where we dive even deeper into limiting. There are also multiband compressors like the Lindell Audio MBC, which offers three bands of VCA style compression. And something that's basically a compressor by another name would be a dynamic EQ, like this Tomo Audio Labs Lisa. Although it might look daunting at first glance, it's actually extremely simple to use. Once you get a good sense for how any of these three knob sections work, they basically all work the same way. And it gives you six frequency independent bands of smooth opto compression that you set like an EQ. And one other compressor in the Plug and Alliance family that's unlike anything I've ever seen is the Adapter Audio Sculpt that does things that only a digital compressor can do. It offers, among other things, upward compression, where instead of taking the loudest signals and turning those down and then turning everything up, it takes the quietest bits of signal and turns them up directly, leaving the peaks completely untouched. Really cool alternative approach to using compression that was really unheard of in the analog domain. There's also some other miscellaneous dynamics tools we can mention, like those by Unfiltered Audio, or things like the transient designers from SPL that allow you to independently control the attack and sustain of a signal, or DSers like those from SPL. So many more that we could go into so much detail on as we go further along in this series on the compressors that you'll find in the mega subscription bundle from Plugin Alliance. Until the next video, you can try them out for yourself over at plugin-alliance.com where you can try out any of these tools for free for two weeks. And if you do get around to trying them out, hit us up in the comments down below. Let us know what some of your favorites are and how and where you use them. Until the next video in this series, this has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop, this time on the Plugin Alliance channel. Thanks for hanging out with me. See you next time.